Test, test, test. Test, test. Okay, we'll be starting in just a few seconds. Okay, everyone, good, good, good evening. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Heart and Hands Book Talk with David Ambrose. Uh, my name is Martin Delgado, and I have the honor of serving as community library manager for our East Los Angeles Library. Uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank everyone here, uh, both our in-person audience and also our virtual audience who's watching uh, via YouTube. Uh, this is a hybrid program that we're very proud to be bringing to you. Uh, I also want to take a moment to thank our sponsors for tonight's program, our LA County Library Foundation. Thank you. We're going to applaud for that. And Big Outdoor. Thank you. Okay. Well, all right. Many thanks, really, for making this program tonight possible. Uh, before we kick off tonight's program, I do want to share a little information about our East Los Angeles Library. We're one of 85 LA County libraries, uh, in addition to a wonderful collection of books, materials, digital materials, including uh, public use uh, computers. Uh, we offer a variety of very high quality programs for all ages, including story times, book clubs, uh, educational events, very many here, and we're very proud of it. Uh, we're strongly supported by our community and also by our friends of the library group, Los Amigos of the East Los Angeles Library, who are represented by Miss Diane McNeil there and Mr. Tony Gonzalez. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> now, our library also proudly hosts our beautiful Chicano Resource Center. Uh, established in 1976 to serve the information needs of the Mexican-American community and to offer a variety of resources about the history and culture of this group to the general public. For those of you fortunately joining us in person today, you'll have ample opportunity to visit the uh, Chicano Resource Center where our resource librarian, Mr. Daniel Hernandez, who's in the back of the room, will be available to answer any of your questions. So. Uh, we'll be going over there for the book signing after our talk, okay? And for those of you joining us virtually uh, via YouTube, 
you're warmly invited to come to our beautiful library or any of our 85 libraries. Uh, we're very happy to have you uh, visit. And I think just like tonight's program, you're going to enjoy your visit very much. So now I'd like to hand over the program to Miss Kate Hennigan, our board chair for the LA County Library Foundation, who's going to introduce tonight's speakers. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Um, and thank you to the library and to everyone joining us tonight in person and online. I'm Kate Hennigan Ohanesian, board chair of the LA County Library Foundation. Uh, we're pr proud to sponsor tonight's program along with Big Outdoor. LA County Library Foundation raises funds to help power your library. With your generous gifts, the Library Foundation supports library program like tonight's book talk, as well as summer discovery program, annual bookmark contest, STEM programs, books and ebooks, and more. Your gift matters. Please check us out at LACO libraryfoundation.org. Thank you. I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to tonight's speakers. Leading the conversation is LA County Library Director Sky Patrick. Sky has served as library director since 2016, responsible for 85 libraries across LA County and resources used more than 3.4 million people each year. She is committed to breaking down barriers and increasing access for all. Sky and her team's work is recognized nationally, most recently with the 2023 National Medal for Library and Museum Service. <clears throat> the National Medal honors the library for meeting the needs of one of the nation's most complex and diverse communities, including with going fine free and with I count equity initiative that ensures library services and programs meet each community's unique needs. Sky continues to reinforce the library's vital role, a civic and cultural center, providing trusted information and promoting literacy, innovation, and lifelong learning. Tonight, Sky will be interviewing the David Ambrose. David is a national poverty and child welfare expert and advocate. He wrote A Place Called Home, a memoir about growing up homeless in New York for 11 years, followed by years in foster care. He offers a window into the kids living in poverty's experience every day and ways to turn empathy to action. David went, to graduate, or went on to graduate from Vassar and later UCLA School of Law. He led corporate social responsibility for Walt Disney Television and served as president of the Los Angeles City Planning Commission and as California Child Welfare Council member. President Obama recognized David as an American champion for change. Today, David is a foster dad and head of Amazon's community engagement in Southern California. I've known David for years. Libraries play a big part in his story and we're delighted to share his message the foundation is donating several copies of A Place Called Home to the library. I hope you'll read David's book and encourage a friend or colleague to do the same. Thank you, Sky and David, for being with us tonight. And Sky, I'm handing over the program to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And uh, thank you for everyone who, just, who made it out to LA County Library, we recognize this is a precarious time to be on the highway. So we certainly appreciate uh, your being here. Before we get started, I'd like to take an opportunity to present to you the land acknowledgement. Land acknowledgement of LA County recognizes that we occupy land originally and still inhabited and cared for by the Tongva, Taktavium, Serrano, Quiche, and Chumash people. We honor and pay respects to their elders and descendants, past, present, and emerging. As they continue to, I'm sorry, as they continue their stewardship of these lands and waters, we acknowledge <clears throat> that settler colonization resulted in land seizure, disease, subjugation, slavery, re relocation, broken promises, genocide, and multi-generational trauma. This acknowledgement demonstrates our 
responsibility and commitment to truth, healing, reconciliation, and elevating the stories, culture, and community of the original inhabitants of Los Angeles County. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these ancestral lands. We are dedicated to growing and sustaining relationships with Native peoples and local tribal governments, including, and in no particular order, the San Fern the Fernandino Tactavium Band of Mission Indians, the Gabrielino Tongva Indians of California Tribal Council, the Gabrielino Tongva San Gabriel Band of Mission Indians, the Gabrielino Band of Mission Indians, Quiche Nation, the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians, and the San Fernando Band of Mission Indians. Thank you. So, without further ado, let's bring our uh, esteemed guest up, Mr. David Ambrose. So, as it stands, David and I are already BFF, so we've already changed the program a little bit. We're going to have him come up and read a little bit from the first chapter just to kind of set the pace and the mood so we can discuss this really intense and beautifully written book. I appreciate you. Thank you. Hi, y'all. Um, I love traffic. I love my car. I listen to podcasts. I call my mom. I had 14 phone calls on the way over here. I left an hour and a half before I had to be here. And I enjoyed every single minute of it. So thank you for the meditative moment. As a native New Yorker, being on the subway was challenging at times. And in my bubble, it presents challenges and opportunities for me. So in all seriousness, thank you to the library for having me. Kate, thank you for being a giant ass first domino that pushed over to pull all this together ultimately. So thank you very much. Um, it makes a difference. Thank you. So I'm going to read from chapter one, because that's where the book starts. You guys are going to be tough tonight. I even wore my jacket. This is my power jacket, if you're wondering. But if you have rough hands, don't hug me, because it's silk. Not kidding. So uh, on that note of class culture, um, a place called home. To my mother, who taught me to forgive and conquer one impossible thing at a time, illegitimi non cabarundum, which if you're a book fan, maybe you'll ask me where that phrase is from and why I use it. A place called home. Chapter one. I'm hungry. I've waited as long as I can, and I now scoot past my siblings to tug on my mother's jacket. She swats me away. Her voice, the voice of a stranger, walk straight, my mom commands. If we stop walking, we will freeze to death. It's Christmas in Manhattan, and the department store windows glow, each one a framed fantasy. My neck swivels as I pass, entranced by the rich golds, reds, and greens. My eyes fix on an electric train chugging around a tree. It weaves through snowy heaps of presents. All I know about Christmas is that every winter, the department store windows fill with magic. And at the churches where we go for free meals, they tell stories of baby Jesus. A man crosses between me, my brother, and my sister, bags brimming with gifts from each arm, his pale face flushed with cold. He steps onto the street and hails a taxi. I watch for a moment as he gets in, and I have a longing I don't understand. I want to be part of his life. I want to be his child. I want to be so blissfully unaware of the casual luxury of a warm taxi. I pull my eyes away from this man, returning them to the backs of my mother and siblings. From behind, my mom's jacket looks like a puffy sleeping bag with arms. The three of us follow her like ducklings. Jessica, right behind her, is seven. Sometimes she holds my hand when the streets aren't so crowded. Then comes Alex, my brother, constantly in motion, jumping off of things, balancing on curbs. 
Then there's me. Tourists shove in all directions, warm from wherever they got their last hot chocolates. I dodge them expertly without pausing. No matter how alluring that train is, I know the most important thing is not to lose my family. On the fringes of this holiday wonderland, in the dark alcoves and corners of the night are people like us, passing like ghosts, around and through bright, clean tourists. We drift in circles, making our home everywhere and nowhere. We hunker down in the colorless crevices of the city, in the gray shadow of gray buildings where the gray snow is piled. We are a gray people fading to nothing. We head further uptown and as Times Square bleeds into the Upper West Side, neighborhoods shift in character. I know this area and most of the city by its sidewalks. These ones are embedded with mica. They're my favorite, they sparkle. The sun sets over Manhattan and the apartment buildings. Darkness begins to spread further. Night is the worst time to be outside without a home. My mother stares straight ahead into the eve of the night, lost in her own delusions. It's cold and it's getting colder and we do not have a destination. Mom, I try to get her attention, but it's futile when she's in this state. She flatly repeats her refrain, walk straight. Hours pass, the temperature drops. Every puddle now has a skin of ice. The snow heaped on either side of the sidewalk is as solid as rock. The city is frozen. My feet are stubs. I stare down at them to make sure they're still there. My dirty sneakers have been plucked from the trash and are clownishly large. The laces wrap not once but twice around the sole and tied in a bow on top to keep them on. Every time I take a step, my foot floats up within the shoe and then reconnects with the sole and the pavement as I step down. I count as high as I can to pass the time, but I keep losing track as my mind is muddled. I switch to songs and stories in my head. Last night we heard the song at a church where they gave us free food and a sermon on the side. It was a story of the three kings and baby Jesus. They brought gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What is myrrh? They walked all night too, following a star. We need a star. Instead, our homelessness stretches on forever in all directions, studded with temporary refuges, a bus station, a library, a subway car, a shelter, a hospital waiting room, a Bowery slum. I'm angling for any of those right now. Mom, how about there? I've spotted a subway vent and can see steam rising for it. She allows us to stay there for just a moment. We end up right back where we started, walking. Mom must be getting cold. Does she feel the cold? I can't be sure. I look at my brother and sister, Jessica's steps drag. Alex, the troublemaker, is silent. My siblings and I have now not spoken for hours. There is no joking around. There is no whining. There is no annoying each other or pestering our mother. We know to be quiet and obedient when she's in this mood. But I have to try something. I take a deep breath. Mom, we're close to the port authority. Can we go inside? I venture. Walk straight, they're after us. Mom is always worried about people coming to get us, but they never come. And we already understand that there are real dangers, but that they are only in her, only in her mind. Jessica trips, slumping hard to the ground, and I stop short. I want to help her, but my thoughts are muddled, and I move too slowly. She silently drags herself to her feet. This might be the coldest night we've ever walked. And through the fog of my brain, it occurs to me that my sister is not okay. Alex is too quiet. My own mind does not feel right. We are disappearing into ghosts. We've done this so many times before, walked all night, We've never had a place to call home. 
never stayed in a place long enough for me to even remember it. But for the first time in my life, though I don't have the words for it, I think we might die. There is a calculation I make when I talk to my mother. Will she hit me and is it worth it? When she's challenging an authority or beating up on one of us too much, I take the risk. I need to keep this family going. I try again. Mom, we need to go inside. In my head, I'm saying all of it and so much more. We're too cold. I love my sister. You're killing us. Wake up. I want to slap her with these words. I can't feel my feet. I can barely breathe. Mom, I've stopped shivering. We're dying. Mom stops and looks at us for the first time in hours, really seeing us. She's going to hit me. Is she going to hit me? Okay, Mom says. Victory. We're going inside, somewhere, somehow. With new vigor, we march past fast food restaurants, hair salons, metal roll-down doors. She must have a destination in mind. Does she have a destination in mind? Finally, we find ourselves outside a box of a building with black painted metal doors. It's hunkered down on the street like it's looking like it's avoiding eye contact. Mom rings the doorbell and bangs and bangs. Finally, the door opens. When it opens, the heat flows toward us and we surge forward, ice zombies toward it out of control. Lady, this is a men's shelter, the man at the threshold announces, blocking our way. What is wrong with you, mom says. She says something about a nuclear bombing in Ireland and the waste getting on us out here. You're exposing us to it, she says. The man is suddenly startled. They are at an impasse. I look between them and I feel a surprising warmth move down my leg. Then the warmth quickly cools and the smell of urine rises up to my nose. I hadn't realized that I had to pee or that I was doing it. I peed my pants, I announced to both of them and no one in particular. The man looks at me for the first time seeing us, truly. His dreads are neatly pulled back, his eyes bright. Like the man I saw getting into the taxi, I wanna be this man too, the person who controls the warmth, who makes the decision of life and death. His glance flits from me to Alex and Jessica. His decision, his pause is an eternity. Fine he says finally, come in. But you can't let the kids out of your sight in here. The kids aren't safe. The guys in here are fucked up. He ushers us into this space, a warehouse-like space, and I see what he means. Some spaces and shelters are bright and clean. This one is not. It's a dark room, and I don't see other children. All I see are coffins, rows and rows of coffins with a single body on each. Are they dead? I ask him. Nearly, he says. He points to a single empty cot, and we sit. We sink down the cot, not ready to shed any layers. I am in the middle between my brother and my sister. As my eyes adjust to the dark, details of our neighbors emerge. They're surrounded by bags of all sizes, belching contents out onto the floor. Sometimes we have bags too, but not tonight. We're wearing everything we own. I smell my own urine, but it's not the worst. It's dominated by the stench of funk, sweat, and vomit that brews in this overheated room. If outside was hell frozen over, then this is certainly hell defrosted. I wonder what has brought each man to this place. Did they come here too with their moms and never leave? My mom stands above us, and I see something in her face shift. Another mom is emerging. This is the one who hugs us as often and as easily as the other one hits us. Is this what you want? Mom asks, gesturing to the room full of lost, strung out souls, the miserable specters of their imminent deaths. Mom doesn't talk about the future. Poverty is never about the future. It's obsessed with the now, as it must be if we are gonna survive. But I sense more than understand what my mom is asking. No, I cry out, this is not what I want. I catch only glimpses of other lives, spotting them and speeding past them like an express train. 
but I am certain I don't want this. I began to weep. I'm starving. I'm afraid my mom might hit me. I don't like it when my sister falls and my brother is silent. I don't want to be here, surrounded by the nameless masses. I don't know what I'll have to do to escape this life. It's truly all I've ever known. But somewhere in the darkness, my mom's question has unleashed a spark. In her question is an implication that I actually have a choice. She's asking me to believe in something better. I'm five, but I already know this. I want a roof to sleep under for more than a night. I want to protect my older siblings. I want to protect mom. I want to protect mom from mom. I want to be the man getting into the taxi with gifts for his family. I want to be the man at the shelter who decides who lives and who dies. I want to be another man, one I haven't met yet. I have no idea what life could be like, but for the first time, I know what I want, not this. Okay, good, mom says. She doesn't want this for us either, the chaos inside of her that spills out to engulf us. She sits down next to us on the single cot. We all lie back horizontal, feet dangling off the side. I'm squeezed between my siblings with a woman who for a brief moment has come as she'll ever will to being a real mom. I curl into this dog pile of my family and sleep. Chapter one. Everyone take a deep breath there. <sighs> you know, I was uh, working on my I am back on. <laughs> Apparently. You know, Make, you want to make you want to make sure his works as well. This was one of those books that um, I had to run away from. Me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I I think that you know I might be this might be ringing true for a lot of people. You just really it was so gut wrenching and so real uh, that it was a difficult read. But as many times as I ran away from it the same amount of times I ran back. I had to finish it. So I was up really late last night. Late for me is like 11 o'clock. I was up finishing this book. So um, we have a couple of questions. We're gonna kind of like vacillate between like written questions and then we'll figure out where we wanna go. You talk so much and you write so beautifully about who I call the invisible kids. Uh, the kids that I think we see a lot in the public library and the families that we see a lot in the public library. And I was going to ask you to just kind of share with the audience this book, but I think that you have entered this conversation so beautifully. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of social infrastructure in your early childhood? And by that, I mean parks, libraries, schools, when you're homeless, I, I would love to just kind of hear how those instituted, excuse me, institutions supported you and your family. So, um, heart of the matter, 10 years before I was born, we sent a person to the moon. We didn't outsource it. We didn't have computers. We decided to do it, and we did it. And now we're proud when we fill potholes. I love when we fill potholes, but I have no idea what happened to that spirit that my country had where we could do big things. The only way we do big things is together. Government is a description of the sandbox by which we create so we can live peaceably amongst each other. 
and that we can do big things together. We're not gonna have a bake sale and solve social problems. No matter how important the work of a nonprofit is, and I support them, the only way to achieve real change is to support public infrastructure, as you call it. And I don't just mean bridges and tunnels. We need to support the people. We have a beautiful thing in our country where we respect and honor veterans, but we don't respect public librarians. We don't respect social workers or teachers. We underpay them and denigrate them. And every time there's been a problem, we layer on more rules to make their jobs harder, as if accountability were the problem, as opposed to the machete we've taken to public infrastructure. The only way we're gonna move these issues forward as a moral and just people is if we invest, I am the product of welfare, imperfect welfare. I'm the product of imperfect foster care, very imperfect. And I still believe in it. We have the ability to make a decision other than the laws of physics, everything else is a choice. It's a choice. And we can make a different decision. I was reading the New York Times a couple months ago and it said something that knocked me on my, my tail. There are 118,000 homeless children in New York City. I don't know where you're all from, but some of you may not be from here. So think about the town where you're from or if you're watching. That would be one of the largest non-cities in America. Full of homeless children. One out of four American kids are starving. 8.4 million live in abject poverty. Do you not, not since 1999 has the word phrase child poverty been uttered at a presidential debate? We talk about coal mining, and we should, it's important. But there's only a couple thousand coal miners. What about the 8.4 million children? Why have we so utterly given up on them that we don't even talk about it? So what do I think? I think we need to center vulnerable people in our dialogue, but better than just talking about it is doing something. And the way that we do that is the infrastructure, as you call it. We can't take a machete to the public health, welfare safety net and then be shocked when it has the results that it does. But even the results that it has are still encouraging. I wrote about foster care and, and you'll read it or have read it. We today have the best system ever in American history. There's no period I wanna go back to where it was better. That's because we keep moving forward. What did Dr. King say? The arc of justice, or the arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Yeah. Do you know what I always pictured in my head? The only way it bends is a bunch of people at the end of it, like a branch, pulling it down. And those are the activists we need not to give up, but to keep pulling that quicker and more readily towards justice. I think he deserves an, uh, an applause for that. That's a staggering number, 8.4 million people, 8.4 8. 8 million children, not just people. So obviously we all live here in LA County, or most of us do, and we have nearly 70,000 people sleeping on the street every night. And I would argue at least a third of those folks we see in public libraries every day. You know, we talk a lot with our team about just feeling the, the, compassion fatigue, particularly after this last three years. Our frontline, our frontline staff, I mean, they are just at their, their edge. Can you talk a little bit about maybe helping us to remember how important as the infrastructure, specifically libraries or schools, how important that is to a kid who was like, who is like you or who, who, who is like you were? Um, so, you know, like on airplanes where they say, put your mask on first before helping another. First of all, you never had to tell me that. Uh, no worries. I think people in service don't do that well. I think they're, um, they're in service for a reason. You don't take these jobs because you get paid too much. Um, so first and foremost, you got to nourish yourself. You know, no one's expecting you to be the patron saint. It is hard, but I'll tell you a story. Uh, I was living at Grand Central, which is a train station, and that sentence is just bizarre, but I was, and I've been living there a while. And I remember this day in particular, I was about four, and I had all sorts of problems. I had, uh, you know, homeless people do not have dignity, and I had so many problems, health issues. I had uncontrolled 
uh, infection and rash across my face, leading to just tremendous disfigurement. I smelt. I had lice for about 12 years. And I had not bathed in a very long time. And I remember this day because we were, we would break up the different trains that would come in in the morning. So I would be in charge of what was called Metro North, which is the train serving Westchester where the rich people live. That's how I thought of it. And my brother and sister would go elsewhere. And I was in charge of Metro North. We begged in the morning. Do you know why we begged in the morning? People are more generous before they have a bad day. And so we would beg in the morning. And I was there begging this day. And I remember so specifically, because you know, you reach different cognitive milestones as you, as you age. And this was one of those moments that I had an epiphany matching my development. I was standing there begging and four feet in front of me in a crowded packed concourse, the crowd just parted and then went, got back together behind me. And I thought to myself, they don't even see me. I am completely invisible. And I was begging. And you could, I was there, you could see me, but people chose not to. And so I thought about it in that moment. I thought, gosh, my family could just very well die down in the tunnel and no one would give a crap. We could just disappear. And we were so many kids and families living like us. And I thought, wow, we are completely disposable. Do you know when you flip a coin, it's heads or tails, right? Wrong. The third side is called equipoise. It's when a coin lands on its side, right? I love language. <laughs> I learned that at a library. Society is a coin in equipoise. It has accidentally landed impossibly on its side. It's a collective delusion. And the only reason it works is because we think it should. And we've realized lately how fragile it is, right? Well, I realized my family was completely outside of society. And it was both scary, but also freeing. Here's why it was freeing. I realized that all these rules that people labor under don't exist. They don't exist. And my family was trying to live by a set of rules and it was killing us. And we had to figure out a different way. And it was just this freeing moment. And I remember so many times growing up in homelessness and then foster care where I had to check back in with that memory. I bathed in libraries. I tell a story in the book where <laughs> I was so frustrated by story time. So if, I, if anyone here works at a library, here's a tip. I was homeless and they would start these stories which were so awesome, but they wouldn't finish. And they'd be like, come back again next time. And I'm like, there's no way I'm coming back next time. So I started this story, they started the story, James and the Giant Peach. I was, I never knew the name of the store. I couldn't remember it for years. And then I stumbled upon it and I was like, oh my God. But I remember this day because I was there and we were bedraggled and just a hot mess. And we sat down and it was story time. I went to story time because there's free snacks. And my mom had just disappeared and it was the three of us. And this librarian started James and the Giant Peach. And I was just like, oh my God, this is the most amazing story ever told. And then this mom came up and towered above me. She said, get away from my son. And you're, she called me disgusting. And to her credit, I was. None of you would want to be next to me. None of you would want your kid next to me. I am certain I had lice jumping off of me. I smelled again, I was covered. And I was mortified. I was mortified. And I remember the librarian came up, a very sweet woman. And she, she should have been in charge of Middle East peace. Like, <laughs> everybody was happy. Everyone went to their corners. And I didn't hear the rest of the story because I just, I was, it's so dehumanizing to be told that you're disgusting. And I, find, I was like, I'm not going to leave because that means she wins. <laughs> so I'm not going to sit here. I'm going to get lice out of her disgusting side. <laughs> I was like, I did that as a kid, but don't tell anyone. And afterward, I went to the bathroom and, you know, I used it. And I cleaned myself. 
I remember so specifically, I looked in the mirror, I washed my face, and there was this line where my skin came through. When you're homeless, you stop smelling yourself. When you're starving, you don't really care if you smell or you look like crap. And you begin to just devolve to basic instincts. And then you're reminded by this world that just wants you to go away. And I opened the story with the story I read, but right before that story, what had happened was they were cleaning up the city and they decided to clean us up. And I remember in the mayoral debate recently in Los Angeles where one of the candidates that did not win talked about cleaning it up. We are the it. We are not an it. Homeless people are human beings and none of us are disposable, despite how frustrating we are. I don't want a tent in front of my house. I'm annoyed. But when we start referring to a whole people as an it, we are one step away from really bad things. Compassion is like saving for retirement. You gotta do it every day, even though it's hard and you wanna do other things. We must exercise compassion. And when you can't do it, walk away. But remember that, that these are human beings. And I just, I just ask frontline people like my sister, like your staff, just remember that. I know that it's hard. I know that it's frustrating. But what's worse is a scar that we leave on people when we dehumanize them. And then we're shocked when they can't get their stuff together and get off the street, when all we've done is tear them apart with our inaction, apathy, and, and words. So take care of yourself, but exercise that compassion muscle. And when it's the hardest, it's the moment you need to do it the most. He, you remind me of um, something, the saying that I use often, um, and it's by Rumi, and it's something to the effect of uh, the way to open your heart is to continue to break it every time. Right? Something I'm paraphrasing, but I know my I know my team knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, you are so brilliant and beautiful, and all of your glory and all of your experience that I have a thousand questions for you, but I need to like, I need to start moving on. Um, I'll go quicker. That was very respectful saying, could you shorten it up? No, I mean, we, could, we could be here all night. <laughs> um, what was your intention? What was your intention behind writing this book? What, what did you hope for with this book? Obviously it's cathartic, right? But what, what were you trying to achieve? So when I was young and throughout foster care, which is very violent for me with one exception at one foster home, what I would do is this image is I would take these things that were happening to me and I would put them in a clear plastic bin and I'd label them and I put them on a shelf and then I would catalog them. And this is literally the mental image I would have because if I sat and felt these things, I would just, I would implode, I would not make it. But you needed to know them in order to survive because it was gonna happen again. In my mid-30s, I became successful. I worked at a company, I was married, I had a son. I was a pillar of my community. <laughs> Some would say. <laughs> and a couple of things happened at once. One, one was the dialogue at, when I was on, I served on the planning commission, the dialogue around homelessness was relentless. And the vitriol and the hate every Thursday was was daunting and I would go back to my car and I would just be like, oh my God, if they could, they would round us up. And eventually it broke me. Some of the conversations around organizations like PATH or these other amazing nonprofits doing incredible work. The way people would talk about these homeless people as if they were horrible people. And I remember just constant comments like that really wore at me and broke me a little bit. The other part was being a foster dad, and my son is, uh, has his own story, he'll tell. But kids, if you're smart enough, will teach you. And my son taught me that I had to be vulnerable in order to give him space to mourn his childhood. Mm. And most of my stuff, most people in my life, including my brother and sister, had no idea. 
People looked at me as I present and have a bucket of assumptions, as we all do. They're shortcuts. It's human nature. And I thought, God, no one knows a damn thing about me. And Coco Chanel, Nelson Mandela, Eddie Murphy, Malcolm X, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, Tolstoy, wow. Edgar Allan Poe, Foster Youth. People look at us as if we're this. We're everything, just like everybody else. And I realized that in my mid, late 30s that I had to tell my story for two reasons. One, I had to come out, no pun intended, about all these experiences, especially about being homeless, because it is an issue in our time. Over 50% of the homeless in the United States of America were in foster care. We have a factory of failure. And it's not the people working at the factory, it's us and our collective apathy. My sister can't afford a damn home within 30 miles of where she works. She's a social worker. Why don't we give her interest-free home loans after 10 years of good service? Instead of emancipating foster youth as we do in this county to homelessness, what if we built a dorm at LA City College? What if we emancipated kids all across this country to a two-year vocational or transfer degree? We own the land. You don't have to build parking. Do we know how to build buildings? Yes we could end the pipeline to homelessness. When you leave foster care, you're more likely to die than go to community college. You're more likely, if you're a girl, to be sex trafficked than go to community college. If you're a boy of color, you're more likely by double digits to go to jail than go to community college. These are the county's children. These are our children. I wrote this book to wake people up to our moral and economic responsibility to both morally, are we okay with this? Let's make a different decision. And then also, as you mentioned, catharsis. I thought I had left this all behind. I thought it didn't matter. I just needed to keep moving forward. And what I realized was you can build the biggest damn sail and catch as much wind as you can. But if you're still at anchor, you're not going to go very far. And I realized that I hadn't cried in over 25 years. I realized that a huge part of my soul I had completely scabbed over. And as things began to fall apart in my life, because I started getting in touch with this, I thought, I got to get this all out there. Like, I am so ashamed of all of this. I'm going to write it all down and put it out there. And that's what I did. Well, um, I, for one, I'm really happy that you did. <clears throat> I think you tell the story of 1.8 million in, in this book. I think that uh, you really have this ability to touch a nerve, the right nerve, the nerve that could really bolster us into action and to yeah. mobilize us. So from that perspective, you kind of touched on some things you think we could be doing. Do you have any other ideas? Ooh. You know, I look at, I look at, I look at Vienna as one of many examples. I look at the city of Trieste who have, a, and, and the Nordic countries who have effectively dealt with this issue en masse. Obviously not perfectly, as you said, nothing is perfect. You keep trying. We are the richest country in the world with all of these people on the street, this city, this county, 70,000 people sleeping on the street. What are we missing? What, do, what, do, what can we do from your vantage point? A revolution led by a revelation. When I close my eyes, I cannot see your political party. I just don't. And candidly, I really don't care. Every time we tell a joke about an elected person, we chip away at a democracy and a republic. We just chip away. We think it's funny. When's the last time any of us went to a meeting where we weren't complaining? I listened to Los Angelinos talk about homelessness, and none of them can even name their county supervisor. They rant against the mayor, That's right. who has almost no power or authority, but she's doing a great job with her soapbox. We need to be civically literate, not illiterate. We need to stop laughing at people in service. When a, when a kid gets hurt in foster care, the answer is not to go towards Frankenstein with pitchforks, but understand that we created that. And the answer is not more rules. It's not to denigrate mostly women of color that do this work. It's to encourage more people to foster. Why don't people foster? People don't foster. What's the biggest group in America economically? It's the middle class. Ask them. They're worried about their pension. They're worried about college for their kids. They're worried about health care. What if we made them county employees? After 10 years, your kid goes to state schools for free. 
all of a sudden you have this largest economic group in our society stepping up. What if we did give interest-free home loans to social workers after five years? What if librarians got interest-free home loans? All of a sudden the people on the front line of government service aren't a butt of a joke. We cannot solve any of this if we don't believe in the system. Ronald Reagan led some sort of revelation or revolution. We need to counter that. Government is the answer. It's a definite part of the answer. If you think there's a better system, how's it going? We need both private and public, but we have to invest in the public. We cannot make it the butt of a joke anymore. Too many of us rely on it for it to be funny. So show up at meetings, have a personal revolution and revelation. Here it is personally. When you look at a homeless person, you say, I can't help that person because, fine, I get it. I do that too. But where we need to stop is not there. It can't be a period. I can't help that person because I'm poor, I'm tired, I have my own shit. It needs to be, but I will do X. What is your X? Give a dollar, give a damn, learn a little bit more. Can you go to one meeting a year? Can you? Can you stop someone when they make fun of an elected person or tell a joke? When they mention the Supreme Court, ask them if they know a single member of the LA Superior Court. Do you know who's sentencing young men of color to jail? It ain't Justice Thomas. We need to care locally. We need to get involved locally. And it starts with this revelation of your personal responsibility and the power of us collectively. We're not a democracy because we can buy anything we want to buy. We're a democracy because we get to choose how we live amongst each other. We need to remember that and unlearn that lesson which has become this metastasized cancer. We need to root that out and realize that the power we have is unlimited and we can make a different choice. I insist that we make a different choice. And that's what this is about. I don't even need to be here. I could just give you the microphone. Um, wow, so many, so many, so many thoughts to that. I will say I love this idea of you really calling a task, calling people out to give a little bit of themselves, either through like the judicial system, through policy, through your local library, through your school, anything. There's so many ways that you could help. And you just got to choose one. And you just got to do it once and then do it again and then do it again, right? So it's like it's, it doesn't have to be this like overwhelming task. It compounds itself, right? After time, after time, and you before you know it, you are a part of the change. And so I just love that you're just resonating there for me. On that, um, I want to go quickly back to the book where you talk about there's this very pivotal moment in the book. There's actually several, but I'm curious what you're going to say this one was. It took you 23 years, uh, and you had to make a choice about yourself and what you're going to share. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So when I went into foster care in the 1800s, my, my daughter calls it the olden days, anything oh after God. three years. It feels like the old days. So when I went into foster care, uh, I was about 12. And before then, society had begun to teach me a lesson. When I grew up in the New York City, it was the advent of something that was called GRID, gay-related illness and disease, which became HIV, AIDS. But when I was younger, it was still unknown. And all we saw under the tunnels or in the parks or in the shelters where they had a segregated space where men dying and I had a lot of sores and it was very unclear what was going on. And it was a very early lesson for me that gay people didn't matter. And even more so that we wish they would go away. And then I went into foster care, which was where I was quickly diagnosed as what was called gender identification disorder. It was a, it was a way of saying that I was gay. And I was not allowed to be placed into traditional homes because we were unsafe to be put amongst families and children. So I was put into a young detention facility for young adults. And I was the youngest person there by many years. And within days, I began uh, to be assaulted in every way and the violence started. And then the, the therapy to make me less gay began. Still gay did not work. Committed homosexual. 
They tried. They tried hard. But it started something in me, which was I realized that I needed to, to harden that there was a lot going on. And if I was going to survive all this, I needed to really harden to get through it. And so I did. And after that first, second, third assault, I realized that if I cried again, they would, they would hurt me worse. I learned that I, you shouldn't scream and you shouldn't cry when it happens. And then you could go, to, go inside yourself and go somewhere else. And as I aged and got older, I never stopped doing that. And it wasn't that I was under assault. It was that I had developed a coping mechanism for this world, which did everything humanly possible to snuff me out. And that that coping mechanism was not serving me to have the full life that I might have. I was surrounded by friends and people that loved me. And yet I was still dealing with this stuff. And so I realized that I had to I had to pull all that stuff off the shelf, sort through it, and candidly just cry my eyes out. Emotion is a superpower. Emotion is a superpower. We're taught by society, especially as men, never to show it. And that compounded my own problems. But when I was 25 years after that first foster care placement, I decided I wanted access to the full human experience and that I was going to get it. I'm a person that makes lists. And if it goes on my list, it gets done. And so for the first time in my life, I, I decided that I wanted that. I wanted that. I wanted to feel like that. I wanted to be able to love like that. And I made that decision and I moved into it and I got it done. And I'm, as you can see, a big emotional person. And so the decision was to allow yourself to open, to continue to break your heart until it opens. Yeah. You're, um, I want to talk to you about daytime television and a new job when you're done this profession. <laughs> this, this is it. Dr. Phil is retiring. I don't know if you heard. <laughs> well, 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 we'll talk to his people. Let's talk about your mom. Uh, yeah. Where's your mom? Uh, so one of the original titles of the book. So when I would write, I'd get very emotional, shocking. And I would start writing titles of the book. That would be if I was David Sedaris, which I'm not. He's hilarious. And I'd like to have lunch with you, David. Actually, I'd like to have lunch with his husband because uh, I'm just fascinated how that relationship works. But um, one of the titles was, are you ready? Okay. Mary's, my mama's name is Mary. Mary's son, no, not Jesus, the other one. I love it. <laughs> That's part two. My mom is a brilliant person. You know, in this country, if you have cancer, we pick a color, wear a ribbon, and march. We put the color on products that we all buy. But if you're mentally ill, you should be ashamed. It's disgusting. And that's, that's our culture, and we need to change it. And we're, we are changing it. It's getting better. But my mom had a progressive mental health issue, a bucket of issues. And she went from a person who was relatively stable to devolve. And, you know, what we did is we deinstitutionalized and shut down our welfare safety net for mental health care because it was problematic. And we promised community-based mental health. Instead, we gave it to the libraries to deal with. I was just going to say that. And no money um, to do so. So my mom was one of those people. And, you know, she devolved. She became homeless. And poverty programs are always reminded me of, like, you're in a lifeboat, right? You are on a lifeboat. I'm drowning off the side. And the poverty program comes and pulls you out, and you go, <gasps> and you're very grateful for the breath. Thank you, food stamps. And then it drops you back in the water. But it says, don't worry, there's another program right behind me. It's rental assistance, health care, one after the other. No one ever pulls you out of the water. You're grateful for the breath, but we try and silo people as if they're divisive. We can just make sure that 
you do, you're going to be this, this, and this. My mom was mentally ill. She was not going to fill out paperwork. She wasn't. Do you ever have to go to the doctor's office and write your damn birth date seven times? Can we talk about that? My mom wasn't going to do that. When we were applying for rental assistance, we had to have an address. We were homeless. To get, to get benefits, you had to take your kid out of school and go sit at the welfare office. Why don't we have health clinics at every K through 12 school? Why don't we have a food pantry? Instead of taking two thirds of the kids entering foster care, two thirds are there for neglect. Do you know what neglect is? It's a euphemism for poverty, which is a euphemism for racism. We hypervigilize black and brown communities, take their kid away and put them in a system that grinds away hope. And then we're shocked when they perpetuate the same cycles of poverty and violence. My mom's mental health was the icing on a very poisonous cake. We were the lesser of society and no one cared. Where's my mom to answer your very specific question? And stop pontificating. When I was in college, I found my mom to be homeless again. And I decided that that wasn't okay. And so I fought for years to get her medicated against her will, which ultimately I have. And I became her guardian. And then I share that responsibility now with, with the state. It has been brutal. And she's very, she would say misfortunate, fortunate to have a grumpy lawyer for a son that is pleasantly but persistent. I refuse to allow my mom to die on any street. I refuse. I refuse to have people with mental health issues like my mom not matter or be invisible or we just want to go the fuck away. We have to care about them. They're all our mother. And when we see a person in distress, if you can't help that person, ask yourself what you can do and then go do that. My mom is fine. She's stable. She has housing. She's forcibly medicated and very stable as a result. And she's very lucky because I had to sue multiple times to renew that. Care court recently passed in this state and I could not be more supportive of Gavin Newsom, Governor Newsom's progress on that. LA County's rolling it out. It is so important that we not pretend to give civil rights to a people who don't have the mental faculty or capacity to exercise them. We joke to ourselves with that. It's not a civil right to watch my mom die. I just, I refuse to allow that. My mom is stable, she's well. I talk to her much to my chagrin almost every day. She calls me and she's doing just fine. So I don't want to ruin the book, but you need to, need the, you need to read the book to understand why I would ask that question, I think. Um, you know, I know that there are going to be audience questions, so I want to end my segment and turn it over to John for our audience questions. I ask every single person this. Sandra is my designer. <laughs> that you gave me the, the name for. That's not your question? Uh, that is not my question. Um, my question is, what are you reading? Oh my gosh. From Libby. Libby, my favorite thing ever invented. I'm reading three books. I'm reading The Givers, yeah. G-Man, another closeted homosexual, <laughs> and Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, um, which took me six weeks to get, but I'm very excited to begin that. Um, I try and read books. I try and read a book that improves me. Um, teaches me and entertains me in that order. So I try and like constantly renew that. And in particular, I try and find something I have no idea about um, and try and read that about that. Um, yeah. Because I think we could all do more with getting out of our bubbles. So that's what I'm reading right now, all on Libby. If you don't, um, where am I talking to? If you don't know Libby, <laughs> Libby is a free app that is available to LA County residents with a library card. You download it and you can get free magazines and newspapers, audio books, digital books. It's fantastic and it's free. And we did not pay him to say that. No. Look, if I don't want to wait, I get it on Audible, but like 
I think it's an amazing yeah. thing that our government does. You're innovating and yeah. we should be appreciative of that That's right. and advertise that. I say it all the time. I have like such respect for the libraries. Yeah. You guys saved my life. I would not be here without libraries. I, I co-signed that. One day we'll have another conversation uh, where it's a dialogue. Um, because you named it, I was like looking at what was I reading? So I am reading a book called A Colony in a Nation, which is a fantastic book. I recently finished, um, what is that book? Um, Lessons in Chemistry. A Place Called Home? Lessons in Chemistry. Oh, you see my phone? My watch just started talking to me. Um, and then, of course, A Place Called Home last night. Thank you so much, David. So we're going to turn it over to one of our foundation members. Uh, John is going to take your questions, and then he's also going to take the questions of folks who are streaming virtually. We'll start with one in the room right here. Hi. Um, hi. I'm currently homeless with my little boy, and um, nobody pays attention, so I try to shed light, and it's funny how... You said that, and we're here in the library, and we don't even look homeless, but we are. So I come to the library with my son so we could feel, um, we could charge his little iPad. And I've been in the shelters, and I try to shed light on the shelters because they're very dangerous. And it's like what you said. They do rape women. They beat moms in front of their kids, which traumatizes little kids. So it's safer for some of us to be in the street than in these shelters. And then the shelters, um, I go to city hall meetings. I met with Eric Garcetti, and I try to shed light. Stand up, son. So you can see we're, we're a little homeless family. And it's cold, and we're hungry, and it's hard. But these shelters, temporary, they don't help us. They don't. Because what it is, it's a waste of money, billions of dollars, and it's just like a revolving prison door, like you said, because... They don't help you unless you have an address. And then if you have an attitude, they're like, oh, we can't help her. They got mental health. It's not that when you're hungry and you're tired, you're not going to answer too friendly. <laughs> you know, and then in, in order to get in a shelter, you have to have your Social Security card. You know that your ID. But when you're homeless, you can't find all those papers. And if you don't have that, you can't get into the shelter. So it leaves it leaves us in the street. I'm not the only one out here in the street. Like, when I leave here, I go with the, all of us, and then we go and we make our little food and do what we got to do. But my thing is I'm trying to shed light is that, okay, I get an income. My income 600 Where am I going to live with $600? I'm willing to give my whole income for permanent housing, not these temporary shelters where you stay and you get a little comfortable. Oh, time to go. And I have to look at my little boy, like, let's go. And and like you said, it, it scars and it needs to stop. But nobody listens to us real homeless people. They don't listen. So I'm glad that you're shedding light. And I'm coming here also because I want to write a book also. Because when I was in the street, I was like you. I was child abused. And I went to the street because for me, it was safer in the street than in my house. So... Being out on the street, um, I end up getting incarcerated. Now I have a criminal background. It's harder for me to get a better job. And, and I think people need to really pay attention to all the little kids that are out here in the street. And, and here in the library, there's a lot of kids that are here that are looking like him. That when we leave here, it's like, where are we going to go? I, first of all, thank you. For, so thank you. No, thank you. They're, you're... Um, you're a beautiful shadow of my family and it's devastates me that we're still having this conversation with my mom sitting in front of me with me sitting next to her. And here we are. And it's a choice we make as a society. The obstacles to get help are too much. And I think individually they make sense, right? We want people to not commit fraud. We want people to make progress. We want people to not give up all of these things and individually they make sense but what happens is when you keep layering a process if we were to design systems today from scratch we would not have what we have the systems we have today were not designed they're the process of perhaps too much paperwork too much process 
And part of it is this fundamental distrust we have in helping people, which is odd. I don't think that's our natural state. When there's a disaster, you see what people, how they react. That's our natural state. We've been taught to be skeptical of helping people. And so we make it impossible to access services. So thank you for sharing your story. And I can't wait to be here at your book event. Because it's, if, so help me God, if I'm sitting here doing this, there's no reason your son and you can't be. And I just want to take an opportunity to say, you know, libraries, we have a lot of customers and users, just like you and your son. And we do our best to provide an, a, a location and a safe haven for people who are struggling, for people who need additional help. I mean, that's what the public library is today. Despite what we thought we would be, that's the, that's the role that we currently serve. So thank you for sharing your story. I actually have, um, have a virtual question uh, that I wanted to ask here, and maybe John, you'll take the next one uh, for you, David. And I was going to ask this question, then forgot. Um, so are you going to make, first of all, are you gonna write a second book? Uh, you and I, I think we have, we have a collaboration coming. Um, and the second part of the question is, are, will this book be turned into a movie? Maybe a documentary. Uh, so the first part is, um, would there be a second book? Absolutely. You know, I want to I wanna do a second book about my mom. Um, since I was about 12, I started keeping her letters and cards and then her voicemails and her digital communication. I have thousands. And what you see is this person who is wrestling with profound demons and the ups and downs of what she went goes through and what we went through with her family. Because what, as much as I talk about homelessness and all these issues, there's these fundamental problems that lead to the symptoms, which the sy homelessness is not the issue. The, all the issues that lead to homelessness really is what we need to fundamentally address. Mental health being a huge part of it. And it's just an other. Right? It's just this other thing. And my mom is this beautiful, complicated human. My mom is really funny. My mom would say things, guys, just, she'd be like, David, if the shit hits the fan, don't be in front of it smiling. <laughs> just funny. Or um, what was one of them? Uh, I, this is me paraphrasing her, but she'd be like, just because you call wa water ground doesn't mean you can walk on it. What, one of my brilliant. favorite things she kept saying in brilliant. the book. Did, did I say thank you? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but we've written her off. We've discounted her. And I want people like my mom's story to be told, and I, I'm blessed to have that. And then I'm working on a fiction one, which I'm not ready to talk about, um, because I needed an emotional break from this. And dear God, I hope it becomes a limited series on a streaming service. What does the word movie even mean anymore? Maybe. Maybe. So if you're watching anybody, uh, call me, um, but I, I do hope so, and that's something I'm working at. Thank you for that. You wanted to take the... Yeah, did someone else have a question in-house? In okay, great. I saw you first, and I'm gonna come back to you. Oh, oh. Hi. So you talk about your mother, your sister. What happened to your brother? Uh, so thank you for asking. Um, sorry, Alex. He's, I'm absolutely sure, watching this. So my sister went on to USC, became a social worker, lives in the area. She's doing, she's doing great, married, beautiful children, um, now in a, a new relationship. My brother uh, left foster care. And like many foster youth do, they join the army. You have very few choices. <laughs> and I think the army is very honorable to do. I wish it was more of a choice as opposed to absolute need. He served honorably. Uh, he joined just before 9-11 when the world was different and then uh, did his service and, and did so honorably and left and went to Duke and got his MBA and worked in banking. It's a beautiful family, two kids. They just moved to Dublin um, where they live and he's got a wonderful career there and uh, he's great. Everyone happy, healthy, well degreed and as normal as anything is, as any of us are, right? So everyone's doing great. Um, I have another question from the chat or from the virtual. Um, and this was another, I got, I didn't follow any of my uh, pre-described questions. I just went with it, so sorry. Sorry. Um, 
you know, there's there, one of my favorite characters in your book is Gabriella. And uh, without giving away too much of the story, you, you move away. And I, I really feel like the relationship with her is a swan song. So do you keep in touch with her? Do you? Yeah. Okay. So there's kind of three key females in my life. My mom, a woman named Holly, who became my foster mom, and then Gabriella. So Gabriella, when I was 16, 17, I was not going to make it. I just felt completely crushed. And I decided I was going to emancipate from foster care. So I committed a little fraud on the court with the help of uh, a lawyer who saw me slowly being erased. And she helped me and I got emancipated. I committed more fraud and got a grant to study la bioquímica and the natural sciences at the university, junior college in north of Spain. Do you know why I chose Spain? I'm going to just demonstrate I, my I, ignorance. I, I have a reason, but I, I was assuming it's the furthest you could get away from your family. It's terrible. No, it's because I like Mexican food. Oh, yikes. I was Hopefully very, you'll I be wasn't forgiven school, for that one. people. God, you try growing up homeless. Uh, little did I know. So I ended up living in the north of Spain in a small village with an amazing woman uh, in a little village. I think it was like 400, 200, 400 people and worked at a bar, worked in the vineyards. Uh, it was La Rioja, the wine country. She was a Basque woman. And I can't speak to other cultures. I can speak to Spain and America. And the centrality of family. And I immediately became her son. And it was at first overwhelming, but two things were important about Gabriella. One is she's a mountain woman from the Pyrenees and is fierce and saw me in exactly what I was uh, and where I was. And she, she helped me heal. And the other thing about her um, and the culture and the society was by being in a different place where there was no expectations of me and understanding that I didn't, wasn't expected to understand things because I was a foreigner, there was some sort of interesting intellectual permission that was given to me and I gave to myself to stumble and not be afraid. And I did. And Gabriella uh, spent so much time and love was poured into me. And I, I give huge credo also to Holly, my foster mom, who began that work. But Gabriella really uh, nourished something in me. And the work wasn't done, but she got me further along. And I, I learned to speak Castellano. I, learned, I graduated and uh, I applied from her home to go to college. And that's a funny college story. Can I tell a story that wasn't asked real quick? Absolutely. Okay. This wasn't in the book, but this is a funny story. So I was in a shelter and my siblings and I, and there was this program that I, I think it was in the New York Times. I was four, so don't quote me. But it, it, I think it was the New York Times. I think it was called the Fresh Air Fund. But it was back before we were a little more woke. And I like woke. I don't think it's a bad word. I think we were more, more competent today than we were about charity. And so they picked us out of the shelter and they said, we're going to give you an outdoor experience. And in my head, I'm like, I'd like an indoor experience. <laughs> <laughs> so they shove us on a Greyhound bus, which they've chartered, and they give me a bag of breadcrumbs. And I'm like, I love me some crusty bread. Who doesn't love crusty bread? And they're like, it's for the animals. And I'm like, we're feeding rats? Like, what is wrong with you people? So I shove it in my pockets, because like, who's going to notice my bulging pockets? And I leave a few in the bag, because of course no one will notice. Then they take us out of the bus, and we're in the Adirondack Mountains. If you don't know what they are, the mountains outside New York City. And they're like, we're going to a petting zoo. And I'm like, what, the, what are you talking about? And so we go into this area, and then they release the animals. <laughs> I've never read a book. <laughs> like, so these animals come out. I immediately pee myself. You see a theme developing. When in crisis, I lie down, and then the animals come over. And they start nibbling on my legs. 
because I have breadcrumbs in my pockets. So I start screaming <laughs> and pee more. And then they put me on the bus. I don't know why I told the story. So it was a funny story, but it was it was we ha it was a real moment of like no intellectual purpose for today's conversation, but a very enjoyable story that may end up in an essay somewhere. <laughs> question. Hi. So my question is related to you, I guess now you as a foster parent, since uh, the foster care world is where I, I work. But I imagine you went into it being a becoming a foster parent with a certain kind of maybe perspective and idea of what it may be like working with the foster care system. And I'm curious how that has actually played out for you um, now that you're a foster parent. So I don't know if you read the book, but yeah, so my, my, I had many, many, many placements, but I only write about three. And the reason I write about three is because it'd be a very long book otherwise. And Holly was this woman who was, uh, is, it's amazing, but at the time she was very, I'm gonna say working class. <laughs> and she didn't, she wasn't a foster parent. And she saw the abuse I was suffering in one of my foster homes, which is pretty severe. Um, and she didn't look around and say, who's gonna help this kid? She did. And she fought for two years. I walked into her home, severely emaciated, uh, losing hair and you could count every bone in my body. And she took care of me. And she, was, she had a hard go of it. And so I never wanted to be a foster parent. <laughs> no, I thought my specialty was gonna be policy. Like I've always been involved in policy. It's so important to me to have any type of law should be informed by the people that are being legislated upon especially foster kids who don't vote. And so that's what I thought my give back would be. And then my sister, who was, a social work, was at the time a social worker in LA County, she would bring me these young, remarkable young people that might be queer or might be highly intelligent. And, and I would try and connect them to services. There's not a lot of services for queer kids in foster care since we had one nonprofit that went away. And so I, she would bring me these kids and I would try and connect them like to the scraps that still exist. And if they're highly intelligent, I try and get them mentors or whatever. And that's what I, that, you know, that's what I would do. And I'd make them come to my office at Disney and I'd be all scary. And this young man walked in and he just broke my heart. I mean, I, I loved him. I just was like, oh my God, I know exactly what's about to happen. And I can't, I don't want that. So I got involved in his life and became the cranky person that I am. And if you've been a planning commission, I fought really hard for him and uh, he changed my life. It was absolutely never my intent. Um, I do hope to do it again. Um, I get like a shake because it was, it's the most important thing I've ever done. Um, he's doing great. He went to college. He's at grad school. He's married. Um, I'm scared he's going to have a kid and I'll be a grandfather. <laughs> Still single. That's really daunting to say that I'm a granddad. But uh, it's one of the most important things I've ever done, not just for him. I mean, f for us, for me. Um, he's doing great. He's got three brothers. You know, they're they're truly the most, some of the most important love I've had in my life. Accidentally became pregnant is what I like to say. <laughs> so we are going to wrap up. I just wanted to take the opportunity. Well, before I say thank you, um, I think another major um, win, there's a ton of wins in this book and your story. Um, was that you went from the streets into horrid, most of them horrible foster care scenarios to Vassar. You wanna talk a little bit about your time at Vassar? Yeah, so I, I remember applying to college. If any of you have done that, you have to attach a check for $65 and then your transcript and then a test that I didn't take. 
And you have to attach all these things, and you have to then prove that you don't have parents. How do you prove a negative? I'm not a philosopher, but I remember sitting at the typewriter being like, what the heck am I supposed to do? And so I applied, and I attached all of these letters. <laughs> You're missing big parts of my transcript <laughs> because I didn't go to school. You're missing all this information because I don't have parents exactly. Oh, and by the way, there's no money because I don't have any. Right. But let me tell you why I'm going to be a great student. <laughs> diploma? What? High school diploma? Mm. Not yet, but trust me. And I got into I got into schools. Many of them sent the whole thing back to me, but Vassar accepted me. And I remember getting to Vassar, and so many things were so shocking and wonderful. Shocking. I went to the book line with my my student ID, and the I had four hundred dollars of books. And the woman's like, "No, honey, no. How the hell was I supposed to pay for books?" And then I remember they closed the dorms for the first time. And I'm like, you closed the dorms? So I slept in my car until it got too cold. <laughs> it was just one thing. I remember the first time someone said to me, one of my dorm or my housemate or floor mates said, we're going to go get sushi. And I'm like, what the fuck is sushi? <laughs> and then we went to sushi. And they brought out raw fish. And I'm like... <laughs> And it wasn't cheap. And I'm like, what is wrong with you people? <laughs> like, they didn't cook that. Like, <laughs> I'm just sitting there. There's so much casual consumption. And it was overwhelming. We would go to the, I know none of you have ever heard of Caldor, but it was like a poor man's Kmart. And they would go and they wouldn't even ask the cost. They would just go buy things. One of my dorm mates had a Mercedes one had a DeLorean. I'm not even kidding you. And people were lovely. But I remember just constantly, I felt like a foreigner. I just constantly had to observe behavior and understand how to mimic it in order to pass code switch in those environments so I didn't get chewed up and spit out the other side. And I had to learn all these behaviors that I just did not understand. I decided to row and join the crew team because it seemed like the bougiest thing I could do. <laughs> I didn't know what rowing was, <laughs> but I rowed. And I got, this, I got this job at the White House. And I remember I went to the financial aid office and I'm like, I cannot afford this job, but this is gonna be really good for Vassar if I work at the White House. And to their credit, they gave me a grant and I was able to work at the White House. And that night I went to work at, do you guys know Planet Hollywood? So I worked at the, the White House from like seven to five. And then at six to 2 a.m. I went to Planet Hollywood and I waited and then I would clean. And then I would sleep for like a minute and I would wear the same damn suit every single day to the White House. And I lived in an empty apartment and I had a towel and an iron. <laughs> like I just remember this, that was like this whole absurd thing. But I worked at the White House because Vassar College gave me a grant to even be able to rent that apartment. It was, it was impossible otherwise. And Vassar has become a better school for people in poverty because I, I was part of that. And they've been so supportive of this book. They have programs to support kids like me. And I, I'm very proud of that. And I also got very involved in here in LA City College. We started a program to support foster youth that's now been at multiple schools called Guardian Scholars. I think higher education is a key, but it, if you don't have the damn door, the key doesn't matter. So access is a huge thing. Vassar was a struggle for me, but it was a struggle that I beautifully came through the other side and have tried to make it better for it. David Ambrose. Thank you. What happened? So before everyone runs away, I have two favors to ask. I'm online too. Even if you haven't read the book, please leave me a good review on Amazon and Goodreads. Totally serious. Two, follow me on social media. And here's what I would ask you to do that, not because I'm selling something, because instead of taking pictures of our salad or what we did that weekend or cute animals, what if we centered kids? What if we centered stories about families that are struggling? What if we centered something that actually matters? What if instead of asking someone the next time you start a conversation in the elevator, how was your weekend? 
nobody actually cares. What if you said, you know what? That's not interesting. But did you know that Coco Chanel was a foster kid? What if we started to center these stories in our American conversation? What if we knew the statistics that I mentioned instead of sports statistics? Follow each other on social media, create a community of goodness and morality, and amplify these stories and actions. That's why I want you to follow me. And I'm selling things on there. So thank you all very much. So if all of you would like to meet David and um, grab a book, if you could follow Martine here, or David, Daniel, excuse me, over to the Chicano Resource Center. He'll be there in just a moment. Thank you so much for coming out.